We've been in on principally one text for about four weeks, Acts 17. I believe we're finishing that text tonight and moving on to another. Sound okay? Uh, those of you who have been in faithful and regular attendance may have recognized that we have omitted one last statement at the end of that precious chapter where Paul had just spoken about resurrection, about the day of judgment to come. And it says, some um, said they will hear again of this matter. Others scorned those references. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. But others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Daenerys, and others with them. I love the King James there. But some clave unto him and believed. So precious God, Jesus, teach us what that means. The man as the message, Lord. The precious and holy apostolic character of that man. One with the thing that he speaks. May we come to that oneness ourselves, my God, by virtue of the word that you speak. Bless this night. Make it holy, we pray. We just thank you and praise you for yet another opportunity to sit at your feet and to hear from the Most High. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, there's a reference tonight about um, now there's no, therefore no condemnation. I just want to append that to say that that's not to say that there's no conviction. So uh, if you get convicted, don't feel uh, strange. That's a, that's a uh, blessing from God. I'm presently under conviction myself. And very likely in some way that's going to be reflected in the speaking tonight. So we've talked about uh, apostolic reality and apostolic perception. We'll be talking further. But tonight the burden of the Lord is apostolic character. And I want to direct your attention to two texts. I don't know if I'll get through both of them tonight. The first is in uh, First Thessalonians, first chapter. We've already quoted from that text in one of the earlier meetings about how when they heard the word of God, they received it not as the word of man, but as the word of God, which performs a work in them who believe that. And Paul in First Thessalonians, speaking to a people recently saved out of paganism, wholly contrary to the whole tenor and spirit of the God of Israel and his salvation and his way, I think we just need to um, have Holy Ghost imagination to realize how enormous a transaction the um, promulgation of the gospel was to pagan peoples by Jewish messengers like Paul. First of all, recognizing the enmity between Gentiles and Jews, thinking of the antithetical character of Gentile and Jewish life, the way in which the one had looked upon the other through the centuries, and then to have a representative come to them out of that Jewish culture and milieu and mindset, one at whom they would probably be at arm's length and, and be apprehensive, and yet for the man to break through these cultural barriers and this enmity and this hesitation or fear is a remarkable statement about the quality of the man and of his proclamation. That's why Paul says in verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. It's almost a travesty to move beyond that one scripture tonight. It deserves an entire night to itself, but only to say that we need to at least notice this much, that the gospel came with full conviction. And it came in the power and in the spirit just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you. I think King James says what manner of men. So I want to offer tonight the suggestion that there's a correlation 
between the proclamation of the Word of God in power with full conviction by the Spirit and the quality and the kind of the character of the mouth out of that one from which it comes. There's a conjunction between character and charisma, between holiness and power. And it's an emphasis that needs to be restored to our attention because in the giddiness of our own charismatic age, there has been a diminution or a neglect of attention to the things that pertain to character and to life. And I myself am most guilty. I, I was embarrassed before the Lord today when he quickened this theme and I had to apologize profusely and say, Lord, I should speak this? The contradictions of my own life, the, the terrible deficits and defects of my own life. So I'm not speaking to you from some Olympian height as one who is looking down from some kind of fully formed uh, God-likeness and character, but one who is speaking out of his need more than out of his uh, a condition that has arrived. And therefore, I know that the Lord is speaking to me as well as to you. The fact that it's coming from my mouth doesn't uh, in any way alter the fact that I'm as much on the receiving end as yourselves. What manner of men we proved to be among you for your sake. If you go through the writings of Paul, there are only two references that will recur again and again. For your sake and for the Lord's sake. He knew no other sake. Certainly not for his sake. He never took himself into consideration. Nor did he regard anything else, nor men, nor reputation. Two abiding, powerful motivations in the life of the apostle that God wants writ into the church itself. For your sake. For the sake of those to whom we're sent and for the Lord's sake. That itself is a foundation for a uh, character that we could, that could be called apostolic. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. Again, we're faced with a quandary. Is this another piece of Paul's arrogance and presumption to make such statements? Imitators of us and of the Lord? How does he dare to link us and the Lord We're in one breath? Either it's the height of a front tree, or there's a genius of something spoken in here that should not escape our attention. Because we're not talking about self-made men, or men who take a deep breath and suck air and bite their lips to affect a certain kind of Christian conduct and standard. We're talking about a man who has become so merged and one with his God, that the, the character of that God is reflected in and through the man. Be imitators of us and of the Lord. Follow me as I follow Christ. For Paul, it was not even a hitch or a hesitation. It was one and the same thing. But who of us would dare speak with the same audacity? And yet the remarkable thing is God would have us, so to speak, and speak it in truth as the foundational fact of our lives. And just as in this and in all other things that God has been speaking in these nights, He's seeking for an elevation of our whole perspective of His intention rather than on that much lesser thing that we have uh, satisfied ourselves with, which somehow is more in keeping with uh, the moderate Christian view of Christian respectability and acceptability, but falls beneath the standard of God's glory and God's holiness. I was reminded even tonight before I got up here of a scripture quoted from uh, reality. Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Be perfect as he is perfect. How, how we tend to disregard or, or think, well, that's a kind of hyperbolic statement that's an exaggerated thing. Uh, as something perhaps to aim at but not to attain. If that's what your faith is, you'll not attain it. But there's a God that would have us to attain it. And I hope I'm not proceeding myself to say that God is waiting for the day when the church, in all its full orbitness, can stand before the world and say to it, as Jesus said to his own generation, if you see me, you see the Father. What we will be saying is, if you see me, you see the Lord. I and the Lord am one. His character is my character. Be imitators of us 
and of the Lord is both one and the same thing. And then Paul celebrates in verse 9 how they themselves report about what kind of an, a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols uh, to serve a living and a true God and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. My God, give us hearing ears that this is not just, what shall I say, uh, posy. This isn't apostolic um, flourish. These are awesome statements that these are not just men who have accepted Jesus, who have made a decision. They have been turned, powerfully wrenched, broken out of a pagan, uh, self-seeking, fleshly, sensual, historic, powerful, time-honored, generational orbit to serve the living God, to be servants unto the living God. This isn't just accepting the Lord or even salvation as we have been familiar with the word but the profoundest kind of conversion which is another testimony to the depth and the quality of the kind of proclamation that they heard from Paul in spirit and in power in full conviction just as you know what manner of men we prove to be among you there's the testimony there's the evidence they were not just lightly saved they were not going to go on just hanging in by their teeth and their fingernails in a kind of carnal no man's land of backsliddenness. They were turned from idols to serve the living God. Would to God that that were a statement of the, the, the converts of our own generation. And to wait for his son from heaven. Well, waiting itself. And to have this kind of... Uh, expectancy of the things that we spoke about last week, that apocalyptic view, the sense of the imminence of things that are at hand, at the door, soon to break in, the coming of the Lord. To wait for that is not just a twiddling of the thumbs, it's occupying while you wait, but it's a tension of expectancy that even these early converts were immediately inducted into, understood and lived by. That's remarkable. We need to understand the depth of their conversion and how they, um, they appropriated the whole fullness of the apostolic view because it was a word that came to them in power and the Spirit, in full conviction, just as you know, as we prove to be, what manner of men we prove to be among you. And then Paul says in chapter 2 and verse 3, For our exhortation did not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God. Whew. I almost have to pause. Wipe the saliva. The juices flow when you, when you hear statements like this. Not as pleasing men, but God. Separate unto me. They keep going back again. Echoing back again the point of our beginning in Acts 13, the apostolic point of beginning. Separate unto me, not unto men, not unto need even, unto me. And if I didn't say it before, I want to go on record now, that if we are going to be attenuated to need at the end times, if we're going to be moved by every need, and I tell you that their, uh, their multitudinous, we will have a kind of ministry that might um, ameliorate some human needs but it will not be a ministry unto him and not to be a ministry unto him is not to be in the power and in the spirit and in the full conviction Paul's ministry was an enormous blessing to these ex-pagans from Thessalonica because it was not as pleasing men but as pleasing God we've got an orbit ourselves to be broken from and to be radically turned to, from man-pleasingness to God-pleasingness, which itself is a statement of apostolic character. Are you there? Are you a man-pleaser or a God-pleaser? You say, Art, you have pleased us in these days. That's not because my intention was to please you. My intention was to please him. And in pleasing him, you've been pleased. The whole tenor of the world is this syrupy, man-pleasing sentiment. 
And we hear it in the voices of our pastors, and we see it everywhere about us. That's why Paul was approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Not something to be bandied about. Not a cheapy little thing that he employs at his will to facilitate his ministry. To be entrusted. The, the very vocabulary of Paul opens up a whole perspective. That either he's deranged and, and out of it and peculiar in his whole perception, or we are vastly from the normative place that God intends for the church. For his exhortation did not come from error or impurity or the way of deceit. With the God that that was a statement today of every ministry. I wrote at the bottom of my Bible, how many of us who would be scandalized to be found in error are not as much affected or concerned about impurity or deceit. We want to be uh, doctrinally correct, but are we as concerned to be free from impurity or deceit or guile? or subtlety, or manipulation, or the use of your voice to evoke certain responses. Paul's word was pure, both in the word itself and in the spirit of the speaking. Nothing was insinuated with it. There was no self-serving end that was uh, uh, threaded through that redounded to him. It was a ministry unto God who entrusted him with the gospel. And isn't it a remarkable thing that he says in verse 8, having thus a fond affection for you? My God, how does a Jew come to a fond affection for ex-pagan Gentiles from Greece? And he's not just a woofen. This isn't just a little sentimental aside. This is not a condescension to men. Paul doesn't know what condescension to men is. It's a genuine fondness. And elsewhere here he talks about mothering them and lavishing love upon them, even given, giving them his own life as well as the gospel. He wasn't just a, uh, an agent for the dissemination of the gospel, some kind of impersonal instrument that God employs to bring the word where it's needed. He was a living, palpitating, feeling, loving man who brooded over the souls to, who, to whom he was brought. He, did, he was not just an antiseptic disseminator. He was an incarnate, a flesh-encased uh, piece of heaven. He was the humanity uh, coupled with God, which was the message itself. And disarmed these pagans from their enmity and suspicion of a Jew who would approach them with a, with a word that was totally alien in terms of their whole consideration and culture. To be such a one. And yet the remarkable emphasis in our own generation is ministry, ministry, ministry. What's your ministry, brother? What's your calling, brother? What are you doing? And you shall be witnesses unto me. Never occurs to us. We somehow think that was a, uh, 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 an error somewhere in transmission. And that what it really should read is, and you shall do witnessing for me. You shall be witnesses unto me. The greatest witness unto Jesus Christ is the character of a people who are like him. The doing will come of itself. What kind of character did Paul display to a people whom, of whom he says in verse 8 that he imparted not only the gospel but also our own lives? Working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. I want to tell you, it's not that working night and day we then proclaimed. Working night and day was the proclamation of the gospel as well as the gospel itself. It was the statement of the kingdom. It was a demonstration of a man who wanted to be free from all deceit and all error, all misapprehension, not in any way uh, having to uh, look to the saints to sustain him as if uh, something could be said about his reputation or his character, that he was in this uh, for a money-making purpose or to advance his own ends. How could that ever be con conceived? Working with his hands, even to sustain those who were with him, night and day, proclaiming the gospel. So please, let's remove the separation, the uh, artificial 
um, distinction between working night and day and proclaiming the gospel. Working night and day was a proclamation, was a statement, was a testimony, was the very thing fleshed out and set before these people who's, uh, uh, to fulfill uh, and uh, confirm the words that they heard. And that's what's been lacking in our generation. We've been hearing correct things, technically correct things, but we have not seen the conjunction between correct things and the correct life. And I think it's got everything to do with the issue of power. And I'm almost sus suspicious to see what purports to be a demonstration of power without the appropriate and seemly apostolic character. In fact, I can put you on alert that that will be the very deception of the end times. Signs and wonders, deceiving signs and wonders, lying miracles, not that people will not be healed. Now, not that, you'll, that there'll not be authentic power being displayed, but what will be conspicuously absent is Pauline character, apostolic integrity, apostolic meekness, apostolic quality of life. You'll see hot shots, lots of bravado and slapdash and great celebration of themselves and people loving it. Diamond studded rings and $300 suits, men of faith and power. But you'll not see apostolic character. I'm suspicious. God help me if if I'm leaning too deeply here, to see the lack of conjunction between character and uh, power. Charismatic, charismatica and power uh, and, and character. You are witnesses, he says in verse 10, and so is God. Here again, Paul, always living in the consciousness of a God who sees all things and before whom everything is transparent how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. You know what the beauty of this is? I don't think that Paul ever imagined when he had this letter written that that was one day going to become part of the Holy Writ, the Scriptures. This is a piece of artlessness. This is a man who's just writing out of his heart. This is a man reminding the, the uh, um, Thessalonians uh, what happened when he came, what, what they perceived and reminding them by that to be imitators of him and at the same time imitators and followers of the Lord. You are witnesses and so is God. In the mouth of two witnesses, it is established. I can say that with complete audacity without a tremor of vacillation in my voice with, gee, is it so or not? With complete certitude and you are witnesses and so is God. You know how blamelessly and uprightly we behave toward you believers. Imploring each one of you as a father with his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Here's one of the greatest, most powerful incentives for apostolic character, for integrity, for meekness, for purity of life that you may walk worthy in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is more than Christian respectability. This is more than keeping your nose clean. This is more than avoiding conspicuous sin or allowing yourself the certain luxury of modest backsliding from time to time. It's the incentive of walking in keeping with the character of God's kingdom and God's glory. And the fact that this was not just a mere phrase for Paul, a mere piece of eloquence, that it was the abiding fact was demonstrated by the character of his own walk. Follow me, imitate me, and the Lord. You like this? I love it. I'm so far from this. I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed to be standing here as if my speaking is the statement that indeed I've arrived at these very things because look at the anointing and the authority with which this man speaks. But I'll tell you that the greatest deception for men like myself 
and you also, is to think that the anointing that attends our ministry is a statement of the approval of God upon our life, our conduct, and our character. It has nothing to do with it. A. A. Allen was anointed by God to the day of his death. I don't know that he ever had a meeting which people were not powerfully delivered and saved, but he died an alcoholic. But he was anointed. They had to carry him up to the platform and steady him sometimes in order for him to preach. And the anointing was always on his preaching, but not on his life. Well, we're impressed. There were people uh, delivered and saved but what might have been the fuller, deeper, more penetrating, eternal value of that work if his character was consonant with his ministry? I don't want to be satisfied. I love the anointing of God. My God, I wouldn't dare come off the seat to stand if we were not there. But to have his anointing on your life as well as on your ministry is supremely and ultimately the apostolic statement to which God calls an apostolic church. Why is God celebrating all this tonight? Not to celebrate Paul or to give us wistful reminiscence of what once was in the early church, but to raise for us a standard to which he would draw us now that the church at the end of the age might be as glorious as the church at the commencement of the age. That the men who stand as our foundation, the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, do not just serve us the doctrines of apostolicity, but that their, their foundation was their life and their character, their model and their example. Follow me, imitate me as the Lord. That you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you, into his own kingdom and glory and not into the Lutheran denomination and not into the charismatic movement and not into the assemblies of God and not into so-and-so's ministry into the uh, kingdom and the glory of God. Amen. Hallelujah. You'll never walk worthy. You'll never walk like this except with that conscious understanding and motivation. Well, praise the Lord. Can I turn you to uh, Acts 20, Paul's farewell address? Lord, help me from breaking up and not crying over this. Here, too, Paul didn't premeditate what his final remarks would be to men with whom he labored and to whom he poured out his life in Ephesus when he called for the elders of the church, bound in the spirit, going to Jerusalem, knowing that trials and afflictions waited him there and that he didn't have the time to stop. But he sent for them, it says, in Acts 20. He called uh, uh, to them, and it says in the 17th verse, And from the latest he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to them, he said to them, dot, dot, dot. He called to them, and when they had come to him, no ifs, no ands, no buts. No question about, well, hey, Paul, don't you recognize that... Uh, uh, the Greyhound bus isn't running and that there's a, a strike at the airport or uh, there's a, a fuel crisis or we have to go by mule or donkey or walk that, 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 F, that Miletus is not just around the corner that this is going to be a sacrifice and an exertion maybe even a, a peril or a danger he called for them, they came he said, boy this guy must have really cracked the whip not at all he was cherished. He was esteemed. He was loved because he set before them not only the doctrines, but the awesome reality of the living God in his own person. He demonstrated what our God is to the Goyim, to the Gentiles, to the castaways, to, to those whom the Jews had despised, at, at whose homes they could not even enter to eat. He called... They, he called, and when they had come to him, he said to them, now we're going to read it, unpremeditated, just out of the heart, praise God for, for a Luke who records this for us. How does it begin? Verse 18. When they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, 
how I was with you the whole time. From the first day. You know. From the first day until the time I left, how I was with you the whole time. He might have said, you know what manner of man that I was with you from the first and remain to be so long as you knew me one consistent, unchanging thing. How do you like that for consistency? Let's call it apostolic consistency. No rising and falling of moods. No up days and down days. Good moods, bad moods. Uh, no being eloquent at the pulpit and then smiling afterwards. You know what manner of man I proved to be with you from the first day to the last. I was one consistent thing through and through. Serving the Lord, not men, serving the Lord with all humility. I remember picking up a, a brother's writing about the tabernacle of David and he had one phrase that leaped right off the page and struck my heart. It, it will never cease resounding. He said, apostolic meekness. with all humility. And yet this is a man commanding men, giving orders, beseeching, imploring, calling them to go do this, do that, taking up uh, sums of money for, for the aid of the church in Jerusalem. Warning, rebuking, exhorting, threatening. Must I come to you? If my epistles are not, must I come in my own bodily presence? Serving the Lord with all humility. Somehow there's a conjunction between humility and authority. That was true of Moses. It was true of Jesus. It needs to be true of us. Learn of me. Take your yoke upon. Take my yoke upon you. For I am gentle and lowly. I am meek and lowly of spirit. Learn of me. Paul evidently did. And you know what God has been breaking in my heart in these days? You haven't done this art. You leaped over the, the gospel foundations the teachings of Christ, the doctrines of Christ, the example of Christ, the Sermon on the Mount, the be ye holy, the be ye perfect, you've leaped over and you've graduated yourself into the apostolic things. You, you thought that the gospel was kid stuff, preliminary, and you wanted to swim in the headier things uh, of the Pauline epistles and the apostolic writings. But where does one learn of him? And how does one obtain what is gentle and lowly and meek, except by that yoke and except by that union and except by that relationship. God has just sent two brothers to me, one from New Zealand and one from uh, Africa by way of Switzerland, to say the same thing. Immerse yourself in Jesus. Meditate upon His Word, upon His way, upon His example. Learn of Him! that you might be like him. And as these men were ministering to me, something leaped into my own understanding. I, who have spoken four powerful tapes on the subject of false apostolicity and have warned the church everywhere to beware of false apostles, for if we lose the, the authenticity of that word, we lose everything and in danger of becoming one myself. What, what is, what is the, the danger? Leaping over the foundation that is in Jesus, in his life, in his character, in his example, in his doctrines, and going directly in to the apostolic swim, learning to be conversant with the heady phrases, and missing the foundation that can only be laid in Christ. For on no other foundation can any man build but Christ Jesus. And I'm wondering if this is just a defect with me, or is this shared uh, in the large church? And now he says to him, verse 22, Bound in spirit, am I on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit sol solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me, but I do not consider my life of any account or dear, as dear to myself in order that I might finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. I love these references of Paul. 
the gospel of the grace of God. My gospel, he says. There's such a sense of endearment. There's such a sense of the gospel as being something profoundly personal to Paul. It's not just a collection of doctrines that are correct that needs to be promulgated to the unsaved. It's something dear. It's something intimate. It's something that's writ in his own life at the very foundations of his own being. It's the gospel of the grace of God who took a murderer and a persecutor and made him the chief apostle to the church. Who took a proud, rabbinical, pharisaical character and made him the apostle to the Goyim, to the Gentiles. He knows the gospel of the grace of God. Really knows it. That's why you can say, my gospel. It's not a formula. It's an intimate revelation of the genius of God as was revealed in Christ Jesus. Taken into the life of a man that becomes his foundation. So he's bound in the spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't know what's going to happen to me. He doesn't have to know. Because what happens to him is completely incidental. It's a secondary matter. He's been warned that trials and tribulations await him there. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. For whom else then is it dear? Can we say that tonight? Come on, let's, don't answer me, but let's contemplate this rhetorical question. R-H-E-T-O-R-I-C-A-L. What does that mean, not rhetorical? It means it's a question raised not to be instantly answered, but to be considered. Can we say that I do not consider my life as dear unto myself. What then have we been pampering and powdering and treating with such elaborate concern and attention? Why then are we so fearful for our own insecurity or, or, or future? He doesn't know what's going to happen to him there. He doesn't have to know. He goes not knowing. Just like Abraham when he was called. Went forth not knowing. Doesn't have to know. What's the difference? Whether it's this manner or that, what detail or that, whether you're shot or whether you're going to be drowned or burned at the stake or be set free or go on or be cut short. Everything is in the hands of him with whom he has to do. The gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. You can do nothing to me except it were given you from above, Jesus said and Paul believed. And such a man can walk through the world freely and even go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem not knowing and it's all the same because he does not hold his life as dear unto himself he's one who's been brought back from the dead no longer to live unto himself but for God a servant no wonder that such a man can, can convert Thessalonians from their idols to serve the living God and not count their lives as dear unto themselves oh the freedom of not counting your life as dear to yourself, but as dear unto him who gave it. Don't give me this women's lip stuff and, the, and this uh, abortion stuff, and it's our body, and we'll do with our pregnancies what we will. Whoever said it's your body? It's God who gave it, who drew you from your mother's womb for his purposes, That we should not hold our life as dear unto ourselves, but unto Him who gave it for His eternal and glorious purposes. My God, if there's any one thing calculated to break the power of our mundane and ordinary Christian, I almost said Lutheran, living, it's that. <laughs> to know that we were called out of our mother's wombs. That we've got the wart in this place and that color hair and this makeup and disposition and frame because of the design of God for an express, explicit purpose pertaining to his kingdom and his glory, that we shouldn't hold this life as dear unto ourselves. It's his. What a freedom. He who seeks his life will lose it. But he who loses it for my sake will find it. And this, like so many other of the teachings or the doctrines of Christ, we've heard, we've read, and we've passed over. And we're graduating to apostolic things. 
And we need to go back to the milk of that word and the foundation that is to be found in Christ and do it! What a freedom, which is reflected further in verse 27. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. I didn't care whether you liked it, you didn't like it. There are the good parts you liked. The faith, the prosperity, the health, you liked that part. But the cross, the suffering, the, the, the filling up the, the, the suffering that remains, you didn't like. But it didn't in any way affect him in proclaiming the whole counsel of God. You got the good parts and the not so good. You ate the whole lamb roasted with fire. You didn't just pick at the dainties. He wasn't turned away because your face changed and your expression changed and you began to uh, uh, shrink back when he gave you some hard things about the necessity of suffering. He gave the whole counsel of God. I did not shrink. That's the freedom of a man who does not hold his life as dear to himself. And of course, if his life is not dear to himself, what shall we say of his reputation? Ha! Huh. Once you've, once you've come to that fundamental ground, uh, of what shall you be afraid? Uh, of what shall you be compromised? You imagine a whole church like this? My God, the world would have to stand up and take notice that to be free in Christ is free indeed. So he commends them to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, saying in verse 33, I've coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Here we go again. He himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. He is not just a man who parrots uh, gospel statements, but that he has so thoroughly internalized them and taken them into himself that it's reflected in his conduct, his character, and his life. It's apostolic character. It's a standard to which God calls us. You yourself know, in everything I showed you, I demonstrated, I didn't just verbally uh, make the statement. Based on the words of Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I worked with my hands to help the weak. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him. Oh my God, everything must have broken loose in heaven. The angels must have been freaking out and falling all over themselves to see the sight of this. This Jew being kissed by these Gentiles, falling all over him and weeping him and loving him and bathing him in their tears because they knew and grieved, especially over the word which he had spoken, that they should see his face no more. Hey, there's nothing impersonal about this. He's not just some uh, uh, wing-ding disseminator. He's not the guy who breezes into the Holiday Inn and uh, speaks that night uh, uh, at your big meeting and, uh, the next, and then runs off with the offering. There's something profoundly personal. There's a love. There's a, his life was given. He was a demonstration as well as a proclamation of the God who had come to them in an incarnate way in this man, grieving that they should see his face no more. I forgot what time I started, so I don't know how, how long I should go on, but uh, when you start yawning, I'll stop. Just looking at notes now, but to be reminded of the one true thing that Paul was day in and day out, in season and out, consistently one thing. You know what manner of man I was among you. And God knows. There's one explanation only for the phenomenon of Paul. It's the continuation of the crucified and resurrected Christ. 
If we attribute the glory of Paul was to Paul, we miss the whole thing. We're guilty again of celebrating a man rather than the God that that man reflected. And we love to do that. We love to think that our past is somehow uh, super spiritual. We can relax in our carnality. They somehow have a mystique, a pastoral mystique. And that's why, of course, they're required to maintain a certain distance, lest you see the flaws and the cracks and the same kinds of struggles through which you're passing. But if we can keep them in that kind of celebrated mystique of a super spirituality, which we can't hope to attain because, after all, we're only the laity, we perpetuate a filthy and vile system that has kept us from the apostolic reality in our own time. Paul is the foundation of a church, but the church must be like him, or it is not apostolic. And what's the key? It's the continuation of the crucified and resurrected Christ. It's death that worketh in me, Paul says, but life in you. For me to live is Christ. In him I move and live and I have my being. In him, in him, in him is the most frequent phrase of Paul. If we attribute to Paul's genius his distinction, or to Paul's Jewishness, or to his brilliance, or to his Jewish upbringing, or to his education, to his intellect, anything that has redounded to the church we have missed it. Those are the very things he counted as dung. That he might win Christ. That he might know him and make him known. Why have we not stumbled upon this stupefying requirement to live the crucified and the resurrected life? Because we have lived beneath the apostolic level. Because there's nothing in the character of our modern Lutheran, charismatic, Pentecostal, evangelical, and fundamental Christianity that requires of us such a quality of conduct and life that would make us aware that we must be in Him or we of all men are most to be pitied. Because our present Christian life is so timid, so unrequiring, so uh, established in a cycle of services and dollar in the collection plate responses that you don't need the power of the resurrection life to perform it. You could be a nice guy and relatively ethical and moral and get by. And if I were to hoist the, the national uh, motto of the United States, it's not in God we trust, it's get by. I had seven years as a high school teacher and I know Every year, every semester, how many students would come up to my desk, Mr. Katz, what's the minimum amount we need to do in order to get by? <laughs> They're only reflecting their parents who have lived in a get-by Christianity all their life long. We're going to need the power uh, that Paul knew, the fullness of that life if we're going to move into this apostolic realm, and to the degree that we will, we will find elicited and provoked against us reaction, rebuke, persecution, confrontation, uh, all the more reason for uh, moving in the, in the power of that life. Is our gospel going forth in the power of the Spirit and in full conviction? I'll leave that with you as another rhetorical question. But just consider, as I've mentioned before, what the character is of modern gospel proclamation. Are you saved? Uh, will you accept Jesus? Think of the benefits that will accrue to you. <coughs> Health, prosperity. This is wrong, that's wrong. Accept Jesus. It will all be turned right. Is somehow another kind of gospel. Another kind of motivation. Another kind of appeal. And that kind of appeal, so ensconced in the spirit of the world in the egocentric interests of men does not have to come in the power of the Spirit and in full conviction knowing what manner of men we were among you. It can come in a flashy way through a supercilious character with his fingers loaded with rings promulgating a message of accept. But we're not going to see men turned to serve the living God. Our standards have fallen wretchedly we are content if men will only accept Christ and then continue to attend Christian services. It's a kind of statistical Christianity 
about how many decisions have been made of men who yet remain pagan, still remain in the world, still loving the things of the world. For none of these things move me, for I do not count my life as dear unto myself. None of these things move me. Show me a man who is not moved by things, and I'll show you an apostolic man. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. And I'll tell you, have they ever gotten slick? Have they ever gotten chromed and polished and sophisticated and alluring? They smell good, look good. They appeal to every sense in us. Paul was not moved by any thing. There's only one thing that moved Paul. It was the spirit of the living God. whose servant he was. There's a certain sense of apostolic selflessness and abandonment to the purposes of God, a mindlessness about one's security, one's condition, one's pleasure. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. None of these things move me. None of these things. To touch the world and to use what's needful and yet not to be moved by it. Not to be impressed by its fashions and its fads. Not to palpitate for the latest design. I am amazed. 57 years of watching the rise and fall, the jerks, the liftings and strings, of tightening the cuffs and loosing them, of raising the hem and lowering it, of this variation and that, and watching the saps like flies fall by the ton to, <laughs> to have the latest thing. Moved by the thing. Such a one will never be bound in the spirit going toward Jerusalem, not knowing. Neither count I my life dear to myself. This is a heavenly man finishing the ministry given to him from the Lord. We need to begin it in a character in keeping with the call, walking worthy of and the manner of him who called us to his kingdom and to his glory. Well, I see, I'm not going to finish this either in one night. There is therefore now conviction. No condemnation, but conviction to those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God for his convicting spirit. Praise him for setting a standard above what we have thought to consider. Who are so pleased with ourselves. After all, we have avoided conspicuous sin. We have not fornicated We've not committed adultery. We've not stolen. But where it said be perfect, we just kind of took that with a grain of salt. Where it said, uh, if you seek your life, you'll lose it, but if you lose it for my sake, you'll find it. We didn't really deeply read God and take into our spirit and believe and do what that word said. We went on beyond Christ without having His doctrines deeply internalized into our being and his example and his meekness forged in our character by union with him in obedience to the word which he spoke. So I want to pray for that kind of revival, that kind of restoration, that kind of character. What a precious standard. Praise God that we have a scripture that is not just a fiction. It's not just an imagined uh, artistic rendering uh, of what some writer supposed or uh, a figure like a fictional Paul might have been. This was a flesh and blood man like as we. His stomach rumbled when he was hungry, just as we. Fasting was as costly for him as for us. Denial was the cross as for us. But he bore it and he suffered it because he did not count his life as dear unto himself. He cherished the gospel of the grace of God. He knew himself to be profoundly a murderer and a persecutor, saved and profoundly turned by a Christ who appeared to him in the way. May that revelation come to an unwary world today through us who have this character established in us. May it come to me. Let's pray. Precious God, Jesus, you talked about our repenting earlier tonight 
And Lord, we do. We repent for being content to be nice guys. As if being a nice guy somehow fulfilled the requirement of God. We repent that we made Christian respectability and the absence of conspicuous sin to be somehow the fulfillment of your intention for the saints. We repent that we have celebrated Paul and celebrated certain men of God as if somehow they should be in a super spiritual category, but after all, we're just pew sitters. We're just laity. We're, we're just uh, humdrums. We're just the work of day world. Certainly you don't expect that of us, do you? When you said, if any man would come after me, you cannot be my disciple except we thought somehow it would refer to another. We've given our mouths to scorning and to railing. We have disdained and we've had contempt. We've spoken uh, in unseemly ways. We've, we've not uh, kept our uh, uh, hold on our spirit. We've taken liberties in our conduct, our speaking, our thought life. We've allowed ourselves indulgence in the things that are private and personal that we didn't think anyone else saw or knew that we could enjoy because somehow maybe God didn't see either. Or if he did, it didn't really matter. We've sinned against the body of Christ because we thought that our sins did not affect the whole body and that a little leaven does corrupt the lump. Precious God, help me help us, Lord. Help us to the grace of which Paul spoke, that we might know the gospel of his grace, because you set a standard that is holy, that we should be like you. Give us the grace to attain it. Give us the grace to repent, my God, for satis being satisfied with a lesser standard. Restore again apostolic character to an apostolic church that you might restore with it the power of the Spirit unto full conviction to the turning of men from their filthy modern day idols to serve the living God. And we will profoundly and continually thank you and give you the praise, the honor and the glory for so high 